What's up, family? What's up? What's up? Hey, you're getting ready to watch. I need you to send, I'm telling you right now, send this message to anybody that comes to your mind that might be God prompting you to send this message to them. I started a series called Managing Meltdowns, Principles for Living Life Under Pressure. You gotta give this man. This message is called, I Think I'm About to Break. I need you to watch it and rewatch it, and I need you to share it with other people. I believe it's gonna change so many lives. All right, take care, we love you. God bless. All right, uh, so let's go together to the book of 1 Kings, everybody. 1 Kings chapter number 19. We're gonna begin our reading at verse number one. It reads like this. It says, now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and he ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judea, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom brush, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said take my life I am no better than my ancestors then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep all at once an angel touched him and said get up and eat I want to talk from this subject in our time together y'all locked in yeah. you ready to receive yeah. all right here it is I think I'm about to break clap your hands if you're ready for God's word I think I think I'm about to break I want to ease into this introduction by introducing an axiom that I was exposed to um, several years ago that's going to be the foundation of the revelation we're going to receive this week. And here it is for my note takers. Here's the axiom. Here it is. More of anything means more of everything. More of anything means more of everything. In other words, more of something in one area means more of something else in another. More of what you do want is accompanied by more of what you don't want. Jesus put it this way, to whomsoever much is given, much is also required. This is what I affectionately entitled the backside of the blessing. See, the backside of a blessing is the burden you don't see that comes with the blessing you do see. The, 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 the backside of the blessing is the burden you don't want that comes with the blessing that you do want. It is what the Apostle Paul describes in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 when he says, because of the measure of revelation that was given to me, I received a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Concerning this thing, I sought the Lord three times and the Lord said nothing to me. And on the third time, after he had given me the silent treatment, he said to me, my grace is sufficient in other words Paul if it were better for you for me to remove this thorn Paul never tells us what the thorn is but he uses the word thorn as a metaphor for something that ain't killing you but it's agitating you did you hear what I just said? Yeah, you probably never died from being stuck with a thorn, but it does irritate and agitate you because a thorn represents a season of inconvenience that is sent by the enemy to agitate you to the degree that you abandon your assignment. I'm going to say it one more time. It is a season of inconvenience that is sent to you by the enemy that is intended to agitate and irritate you to the degree that you abandon your assignment in order to avoid the irritation. The Bible says it was a messenger of Satan. So Satan is the one that sent the thorn. But the Bible says Satan sent it, God looked at it, he liked it, so he left it. Are y'all gonna talk back to me 12 o'clock? Satan sent it, God looked at it, he liked what Satan sent, so he left it. And he says, Paul, I like this. I 
don't like the agitation you're experiencing, but I like the outcome in you is producing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you help, grace, to endure what I'm not going to change. Because you say you've never been worse. But I'm looking at you and I'm saying you've never been better. You saying I have never been in this much pain. He says, but I'm looking at you and you've never been in this much prayer. You're saying, I have never been this irritated. God's like, you've never been this anointed. So I like what this is producing in you. So I'm going to give you grace to alter and handle what I'm not going to alter. So once Paul got a revelation of this, he said, I'd rather glory in my infirmities so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For I realize now that when I'm weak, you're strong. It's the backside of the blessing. More revelation for Paul meant more warfare. Revelation is the front side. Warfare is the backside. More responsibility is the front side. More stress is the back side. More notoriety is the front side. More haters is the back side. More influence is the front side. More criticism is the back side. More kids is the front side. Less sleep, more bills, more worry. That's the back side. More square footage is the front side. More expenses is the back side. More locations is the front side. More agitation is the back side. More staff is the front side. More problems is the back side. Come here, Christopher Wallace. More money is the front side. More problems is the back side. There's a back side to every blessing. You do not get more of what you do want without getting more of what you don't want. And this is why it's important that we respond to God's timetable and divine delays with appreciation and not agitation. It means that you and I have to develop trust, not just for God's character, but trust for God's timing. I know you trust his character. I know you know he's good. I know you know he's a way maker. I know you know he's loving. I know you know he's kind. You trust his character, but you also got to trust his timing. He says, because sometimes I'm not delaying things to delay things. I'm delaying things to give you an opportunity to develop in an area. I'm using the delay for your development. It's not, uh, it's not that you're not developed enough for the front side. You gifted enough for the front side. You smart enough for the front side. You anointed enough for the front side. You experienced enough for the front side. He says, but the development has to happen not on the front side but you need development for the back side you can handle the promotion I don't know how you can handle the pressure you can handle the influence but when them haters get to chirping you gonna start chirping back and I need you to be high enough to know that if a dog bark at the moon nobody looks but when a moon starts barking back at the dog everybody pays attention you need to know you the moon not the dog It's like David, when he got in the palace, David, you can handle the palace. But I know you a little bit. So this is why, David, when I anointed you, I didn't immediately make you king. I made you wait. Because you got a little knuck if you buck in you. you. You sleep with a sword under your pillow. You fight lions and bears. So I need to develop you a little bit because you're not used to people throwing spears at you and not being able to throw them back. 
Y'all miss what I just said. When David got in the palace, the, the old king was so intimidated by David that he started throwing spears at David because David's success triggered Saul's insecurity. And you think everybody is happy about your elevation. Not realizing that your elevation is a revelation of somebody else's security. And the same Saul that celebrated you in one season can be throwing spears at you in another season when he feels threatened by your success. Y'all don't want to hear this. You don't want to hear this. Saul has slain thousands. He was okay with that. David has slain tens of thousands. It's like, I don't mind David shining as long as he don't outshine me. God says the backside. Because when I take you where I'm taking you, if they chirp at you, it ain't news. That when I, when, I, when I do what I'm getting ready to do in you, you can't respond. <laughs> in ways that you used to respond. So I got to deliver you from the need to show people who need to be handled that you can handle them. I've got to move you out of madness into meekness. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is not the absence of power. Meekness is power under control. You meek when you're able to look at them and say, I could, but I won't. I could ruin you right now. But I'm so secure in who I am, you don't have to know it. I know it. It's not the front side. It's the back side. So God's like, I I, I promise you, I'm going to get you there. I promise you, though the vision tarries, wait for it. But in the end, it will speak and not lie. I, I promise you, I will finish the work that I started on the inside of you. I promise you, I will do exactly what I said. But you got to let me develop you for the backside. Because if we are ready for the front side, but not ready for the backside. What is intended to be a blessing will end up feeling like a curse. If we don't learn how to manage the backside, we'll find ourselves managing meltdowns because the agitation can become so intense that what was intended to be a blessing can end up causing a breakdown. Therefore, there is a life skill that we need to learn that's extremely important but often overlooked. And this life skill I'm talking about is not skill development. Right? And I understand the importance of skill development. I understand that gifts and callings come without repentance. So it means they're irrevocable. Once God gifts you, he don't ungift you. Now he'll lift the anointing, but he won't remove the gift. Right? So, so, but, 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 so I understand the importance of gift, and I know the, the importance of, right, Paul tells Timothy not only stir up the gift, but he also tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.14, don't be negligent with the gift. It means that when God gives you a gift, don't just lean on that, develop that. Did y'all hear what I just said? Yeah. Don't, 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 they're just, don't just lean on it, develop it, so that you take that gift to a skill. And then you perfect that skill and you move from skilled to mastery. 
Mastery is dominion over a competency. And you cannot take dominion in a street until you've taken dominion over a skill set. Because your skill set is what matters initially in the streets. Your, your virtue matter in church. It's your value in the marketplace. Y'all not talking to me. And many people confuse their value in the eyes of God with the value they bring to the marketplace. It's like in the eyes of God, yes, you're invaluable. In the eyes of God, you deserve the world. That is not the same as the value you actually bring to the marketplace. Because your ability to, to improve a street is going to be tied to a set of a dominion over a skill set. And the problem is, some of you are too gifted. I don't know why I've been preaching like a bishop all day. Like, I'm preaching like a 61 and a half old bishop. Get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. So I understand the importance of skill development. Don't get me wrong. But this life skill I'm talking about is not skill development. This life skill I'm talking about is soul keeping. I'm not talking about developing a skill. I'm talking about keeping your soul. All throughout scripture, we see this term called soul, don't we? Soul, 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 soul. Receive with meekness the engrafted word of God, which is able to save your soul, right? We are soul, soul, soul. It can be real confusing though, right? Because you hear body and then you hear flesh and then you hear spirit and then you hear soul. It's like, yo, which one is this? This is, this is the same. But the Bible, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews that my spirit and my soul ain't the same thing because Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the spirit and the soul. Just like joints and ma bones and marrow are intertwined he says spirit and souls that way so he says now listen your soul he says it takes sometimes it takes the word to separate your soul from your spirit you're like this God this me it take the word to separate it <laughs> right so he said he says it, it, it's important the soul is the invisible intangible part of you that includes your mind your will, your emotions, your imaginations, and your affections. Your mind, organ of thought. Will, organ of decision. Emotions give you the capacity to feel. Imagine, imaginations give you the passion, capacity to envision a future. And then affections is what you emotionally attach yourself to. God say, now I gave you a soul, but you got to keep it. Y'all better talk to me. He says, it is your responsibility to be a good steward over your mind, your will, your emotions, your imaginations, and your affections. I will tell you how to do it. I will empower you through the Holy Spirit to do it. But you have to take responsibility to be the keeper of your soul because you're responsible for what goes on with your mind. You're responsible for what goes on with your will, your emotions, your imaginations, and your affections. This is the way Paul, uh, Solomon puts it. He says, guard the heart with all diligence, for out of it flows the issues of life. He said, guard your heart. Put a fence around your heart, not a wall. I'm not going to bother that because pain will make you put a wall when you should have put a fence. Ah, yeah, 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 yeah. Some people overreact to pain and in their overreaction they build a wall when you need to build a fence. What's the difference? A fence has a gate. And the gate can let the right things in. But the gate can also let the wrong things out. I don't know who this is for, but it's gate season. Let me go to this side and see who's going to talk back to me. It's gate season. I'm not being stuck up. 
I'm not being condescending. I don't think I'm better than you, but I can't let everybody and everything have access to my mind, have access to my emotions, have access to my will. You got to earn the right to get on the other side of the gate. And some of our problems if you, is that you have no criteria for who gets on the other side of the gate. We think standards is judgment. My standards for me are not a judgment of you. Y'all didn't hear what I just said. My standards for me are not a judgment of you. My standards for me have nothing to do with what I think about you. My standards for me have everything to do with what I think about me. Now, if you feel judged by my standards, you need to take that up with God. I'm not judging you. I'm setting a standard for me because I know who I am and I know what I'm worth and I know what value I bring to your life. I know your life get leveled up when I'm in it. I know when I'm all in, I'm all in. I know when I'm with you, I'm with you. And if you can't reciprocate, you got to vacate. Guard it. Solomon told you to guard it. He said, you guard it. You guard it with diligence. For out of it flows the issues of life. You have too much responsibility in this season to be reckless with your heart. You got bills now. You can't be in the bed, not able to go to work so you can pay the bills because you messed around and been reckless with your heart. I just don't feel like you got to get yourself together. You got kids that are dependent upon you. You got a building business you got to build. You got a brand you're establishing. You can't be reckless. We've been taught to keep an image. We've been taught to keep our ego. We've been taught to keep income. But we have not been taught how to keep us all. So we follow the patterns of this world and engage in grind culture. I don't care who preaching it. It ain't the way of the kingdom. Show me a time where you see Jesus running. I'll wait. You never see him running. You always see him walking. Grind culture is Adamic, Adam-like in nature by the sweat of your brow. Come on now, I'm not saying don't work hard. When I say grind grind culture, I'm talking about this culture of self-destructive behavior that is celebrated in dominant culture that is actually fear driven not faith driven because I'm getting ready to show you in a minute it don't take faith to go but it takes faith sometimes well it doesn't always take faith to grind but it does take faith to stop No, no, no. Don't just tell me you got faith by what you're starting. You really got faith, but you can stop. I'm not saying don't work hard. 
I work hard. I work very hard. But I'm getting ready to show you there's a divine rhythm that God's called you to live with. Come on now. It's a rhythm. It's, it's a rhythm you see in the creation narrative where he grinds for six days. And then there's a seventh day where he rests not as a response to fatigue because if the only time you stop is when you're tired, you missed it. God didn't stop because he was tired. God stopped because he was accomplished. He looked at the quality of his work and said, that's good. That's good. That's good. That's good. Oh my God. It, take, it take faith. And when we, don't in, when we don't understand this, we end up like this individual uh, in our text in 1 Kings chapter number 19. I got seven minutes and 23 seconds. Y'all all right? Okay. Here, this text exposes us to an experience one of God's most powerful and prominent prophets had named Elijah. In a few, what we picked up in 1 Kings 19, but in chapter 17 uh, and 18, we see an incredible example of how impactful and influential Elijah is. <clears throat> in chapter 17, he makes an announcement to a king named Ahab who was leading Israel down the road of desolation, desecration, and destruction. And he tells the king, there will be no rain in the land until I say so. Am I in the book? He said, he said not, there will be no rain or no dew in the next few years except at my word. He's talking spicy. And God shut up the heavens and it, <laughs> and it did not rain until he said so. And in the midst of this famine, God says, okay, I'm going to protect you, Elisha, from the consequences of a word that you spoke to correct the king. I'm not going to let you suffer because of somebody else's insubordination. So I'm still going to send the correction, but I'm going to give you a strategy on how to survive in the midst of a drought. So he tells Elijah, he says, I want you to go down to a ravine east of the Jordan River. He says, you will drink from the brook and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. Are y'all here? He says, you're going to drink from the brook and, and I have directed the ravens to supply you with food there. I got to get out of here, but this statement suggests a few truths that we would be irresponsible to overlook. The first one is this. Sometimes your provision is on the other side of instruction. Where my blessing? Your blessing is where you're supposed to be. God, I want you to supply me. God's like, I don't supply you on your terms. I supply you on mine. I told you I was going to make a way and I told you where I was going to do it. You looking for the blessing, get to the brook. Am I making sense here? The enemy doesn't want you to get to the brook. The enemy doesn't want me to get to the brook. The second thing I see in this text is this. God directed the ravens to feed him there. He says, I've directed the ravens to feed you there. Here's the second thing you need to see. God speaks raven. It means that he is not limited by normal communication barriers. It means that he knows how to get through to whatever has what you need. Ha! It, it means that just because you can get through to them doesn't mean they, could, they can't be gotten to because God know how to speak the language of whatever has what you need. Jonah teaches us that he speaks well because the Bible says a whale swallowed Jonah and Jonah stayed in the belly of that whale for three days. But it says on the third day God spoke to the whale and the whale had to spit Jonah out. And I don't know what has swallowed 
swallowed you. Maybe stress has swallowed you. Maybe despair has swallowed you. Maybe anxiety has swallowed you. But when God speaks to your well, whatever has swallowed you has to spit you out. Whatever's holding you has to let you go. Moses teaches us he speaks rock because when Israel had nothing to drink God was able to make water come out of a rock now rocks don't have openings for water but God will make closed things open up in order to bless you he'll make closed minded people open up he'll make closed hearts people open up and Jesus teaches me that God speaks grave because the grave had Jesus for three days and three nights I don't care what is dead in your life dead things have ears and God knows how to reach the ears of a dead thing and perform a resurrection something's getting ready to get up in your life something's getting ready to get up in your life something's getting ready to get up in your life I don't know how long it's been dead I don't care how dead it is something's getting ready He says, I directed the ravens to feed you there. Now, I don't know if you know much about ravens, but ravens aren't birds associated with being friendly with people. They aren't known to be birds that are giving. They are taking. But God will temporarily suspend a thing's nature make it behave in a way it normally wouldn't behave and bless you and then by the time it returns back to its normal nature of taking it's too late he said I'm going to make mean people nice for a minute so that they can release to you what you need and by the time they come back to their mean ways, it's too late now. They've already opened the door. They've already made the way. Now watch this. He didn't change the nature of ravens. He suspended it. Which means because I suspended it, they're going to go back to the old ways. So I suspended it so you, so watch this, so it could bless you. But since I didn't change it, you still can't trust it. Did you hear what I just said? And some of us get confused between that which God uses to bless you and that which God sends for you to befriend. Everything he uses to bless you can't be trusted. sends him to that brook he feeds to the ravens and the Bible says that the brook dries up he's like man what am I going to do and God's like I'm sovereign not the source and you're panicking when the brook dries up is a revelation that you have faith in the, source, in the resource not the source he says oh you think the only thing I can use to keep you is a brook oh you thought the brook was keeping you Oh, you thought you, <laughs> you thought the brook was keeping you? I was keeping you. I just chose to use the brook. Your time there is up. Go to Zarephath. I got a widow woman in a patriarchal society where women did not have the ability to properly tend for themselves. He says, I'm sending you to a widow woman in Zarephath who's got lack. And she don't take care of you. I don't even have time to bother that. And he, gets, <laughs> he <laughs> and goes to the house. He said, what you doing? She said, nothing. I'm getting ready here. But I'm about to cook you know, some, some cake. And then me and my son going to eat it. Then we're going to die. <laughs> I 
There's a lot of detail. He's just like, he like, what you doing? Well, I just left the grocery store and um, <laughs> and then me and my, I'm about to go in here and cook it. I'm a fried. I ain't got the right kind of pan. I'm gonna use this other pan. And me and my son, we're gonna eat it. We're gonna die. He says to her, "Make me one first. First of all, who are you?" Last I checked, you are not one of my children. My husband is dead. Who are you talking to? He didn't say make me one only. Because God never... Uh, when it comes to God's godness, he asks for exclusivity. In every other area, he just asks for priority. He said, I got to be the only God now. He says, but everywhere else, I don't have to be only. I just got to be first. And it takes faith to put him first. So first isn't about first. First is about faith. Because once you... <sighs> once, once she gave to him first, he, she had to trust that there was going to be enough flour left to take care of her and her child and the Bible says that when she did it the flower lasted and was extended she was able to take care of her and her son don't miss this there's no record in the text of God sending somebody to give them more because God does not have to give you more to give you more God has a way of taking what you have and making what you have last. God has a way of rebuking the devourer. So the thing that was devouring up what you have, he says, I'll rebuke that and you can have more even if you don't get more. So because she was first, not only did her flower extend, because he was first, not only did her flower extend, he stayed there for a while, Marlon. And God, by his providence, delayed a son's sickness until Elijah was in the house. That same son that was with her got sick and died. But God's timing is his kindness because he died with a prophet in the house. Did you hear what I just said? And I know some, we never want bad things to happen. But sometimes when bad things happen, we're like, man, this is the worst time for this to happen. And God's like, you have no idea that this could have happened at a worse time. But I let this happen while there's a prophet in the house. She goes down to where the prophet is and say, oh my God, what happened? My son is dead. Elijah goes up, he lays on top of the boy and says, Father, put life back in him. And this dead boy is raised back to life. Then in the next chapter, he gets into this showdown with false prophets and calls down fire from heaven. And false pro Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? And, and, and false prophets are, are consumed and Jezebel. God ain't got time. I got to come back and teach this. And Jezebel, who was the wife of Ahab, Jezebel, who had great potential, but did not partner with a strong leader. Okay. The problem, wasn't, the problem with Jezebel wasn't just Jezebel, it was Ahab. Who wasn't strong enough to catch it soon enough. Okay, it's something different. Watch this. <laughs> she says, All right, since you did this to these prophets, by this time tomorrow, I want all this to be done to you too. Just like they were consumed, you were going to be consumed. And the Bible says, This man who had done all this stuff, 
this man who had shut up heaven with his words no rain this man who had ravens come and feed him this man who could lay on top of a dead child and bring him back to life this man who could call down fire from heaven to consume sacrifices on an altar is sitting under a tree saying I had all I can take God take my life this man that was doing all this ministry is literally having a meltdown Oh, what a difference a chapter can make. Yeah. Don't miss this. Don't miss this. But what if I tell you the meltdown that happened in chapter 19 was contributed to by the contributions he was making in chapter 17 and 18? Maybe the more of chapter 17 and 18 caused the meltdown of chapter 19. Maybe the passion for his assignment caused him to put off his own self-care. Maybe his service to others was causing him to neglect his own soul. Maybe the way he went about doing the work of God was destroying the work of God in him. Maybe he didn't realize that being used will feel like being used that the only way you can avoid being used by people is to refuse being used by God and when he's sitting under the tree none of the people he was fighting for were fighting for him maybe his life is teaching us that meltdowns become inevitable when we become obsessed with what we're doing but not attentive to how we're doing he's doing all this ministry in 17 and 18 and didn't realize at some point he stepped out of the anointing and into adrenaline and because he was so good at what he does he's still getting results with the gift alone he emptied in other people full he weak and other people still getting strong he wore out and other people still getting refreshed. But that overuse of the adrenaline probably led to adrenaline fatigue and that adrenal fatigue now may cause him to be emotionally fragile. And because he's emotionally fragile, now one threat from a woman causes him to have a meltdown where he's asking God to take his life. It's like that one word from Jezebel shouldn't have... Uh, that one little thing shouldn't have pushed him there. It shouldn't have broken unless he was already cracked. Because sometimes the cracks are so small you can't see them. You can't survive a famine, resurrect a boy, call down fire from heaven and not get some cracks you can't go through all you've been through and not get some cracks I know you survived it but it cracked you I know you better off now than you were then but it cracked you Pastor Shamika and I teach this concept in relationships um, from William Harley. It's called the love bank. Because feelings of being in love, <clears throat> we've been at this 23 years, feelings of being in love are not just associated with the newness of a relationship. It's associated with the deposits you make. So the feeling of being in love is a result of a love bank being full. And when stuff is new, you're doing things you should be doing when it's old. You're listening to each other. You're paying attention to each other. You're talking to each other. And so here's the problem. When you making deposits and everybody else is making withdrawals, at some point your account becomes bankrupt. And in life, what most of you are doing is you're going through life making deposits and everybody else is making withdrawals.
and your account, your emotional resilience is running so weak. I'm getting ready to talk about this because sometimes it don't manifest in despair like Elijah. We're going to talk about this all month. Sometimes it manifests in irritability like Moses. So some of you not sad, but you so irritable. Your kids don't know which, which version of you they're going to get. John Mark Homer says, love has a speed and hurry ain't one of them. <laughs> Cracked. And this man that's performing miracles in one chapter is literally having a meltdown in another because he didn't realize more responsibility requires more replenishment. <laughs> and you can't keep doing this the way you're doing it because I want you to hear me as a, with a pastoral heart. If you don't do something, your chapter 19 coming. John Marcoma also says when you go against God's grain, at some point you're going to get splinters. Don't be deceived. He's not mocked. At some point it catches up. But you can be deceived and think it's not going to catch. You can think you've gotten away with it forever because you've gotten away with it this long. But you can't. I had a, I had a, I had a chapter 19 in 2014. I had it. Burnt out. Anxiety attack. I had it. Because I knew how to develop skill, but nobody taught me how to keep your soul. Nobody taught me, Darius, you can get to the same place God's way. That you can reach your goal without destroying your soul. That culture say, you can't have it all. In the kingdom, yes, you can. You can have the career and the marriage and the money and the morals. Y'all not talking to me. In the kingdom, you can. You and I are cracked. But, but by, by God's grace, he finds Elijah here, but he doesn't leave him here. And he won't leave you there either. Here's what he told Elijah. Here are three things I see Elijah needed. We need it. We need also. The first thing is this. We need rest to replenish our soul. If you, if you look at the text, the Bible says the first thing Elijah did was sleep. He falls under that tree, <laughs> sits under that tree, says, God, take my life. An angel come, touch him, then he falls asleep. Rest isn't just about sleep. Rest is a larger principle. It speaks to a rhythm seen in the creation narrative when God worked six days, rested one, not as a response to fatigue, but as a result of accomplishment. It is a personification of the principle of the Sabbath. The Sabbath isn't just about a day. It's an act of holy resistance to the notion that my life is defined by my production and consumption. The fourth commandment, which is to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, is necessary to keep the other three commandments that relate to God and the bottom six that relate to your neighbor. He gives the commandment of Sabbath to a people who had come out of Egypt. And the only thing they knew was being driven by a Pharaoh. If all you doing is grinding, that's not the father leading you. It's a Pharaoh driving you. You still in Egypt. Bound. And you got to be careful because the enemy will use the trauma of poverty. I'm telling you where I've been. He will use the trauma of poverty to create a fear in you of never going back to that. 
where you almost destroy your life trying to maintain a certain quality of life. That's not the heart of the Father. That's the fear of Pharaoh. God's like, I will supply your needs. But I got another way. He gives the, the commandment of rest to a people who only know Egypt and a relentless, inconsiderate taskmaster named Pharaoh and a way of life where they had to make bricks from straw. The God who liberated them liberates us from this life. Hebrews says, therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let's be careful that none of you have found to fall in short of it. For we also have had the good news proclaimed to us just as they did. But the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share it, share the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who believe enter that rest. The rest of God. What is this? It's a divine rhythm of work and replenishment. Pouring out and refilling. It is an act of holy resistance. It is saying, I will not be like what I see in culture. I will not be like what I see in church. I have faith that God can help me win another way. I'm done. I'm up too long. This is number two. We need food so our soul isn't famished. The angel told him, get up and eat. He needed to do it physically. We needed to do it spiritually. However, the text didn't just tell him to eat anything. The text tells him what he ate. The text says he had some bread and some water. And some of our issue isn't that we aren't eating. You're just not eating bread. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. Bread speaks to his word. You eating all sorts of motivation. You eating all sorts of teaching. You eating all sorts of, y'all not talking to me, all sorts of courses and nothing wrong with that. But where's the bread? Because all the other stuff don't leave you full. It's no bread. Something that stick with you so you don't have spiritual stamina because you're eating chips and spiritual candy and cute teaching it's cute, it's lit but are you full? don't play with me I'm trying to raise a family give me bread I'm trying to keep my mind. Give me bread. I'm trying to carry out my purpose. Give me bread. I'm done, Tario. Number three, we need Elisha's who don't allow us to live in isolation. This man's problem was he was operating in isolation, Marlon. He was so used to being needed by people, he didn't know he needed people. It's on the other side of this breakdown that God sends him Elisha y'all missed this he knew how to help but he didn't know how to be helped Elisha represents the people that God sends not because they're assigned to deal with you but they're assigned to do life with you they've been assigned are y'all hearing me Elijah literally felt like I'm the only one he was living in isolation but God sent him someone who was called to walk with him but he's so cracked. He think he don't need who he do need. He's so used to being used that he can't see God has finally sent him somebody that's not going to use him. Because in 1 Kings 19.20, it says, Elisha then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and mother goodbye, he said, and then I'll come with you. Go back, Elijah said. What have I done to you? He's about to miss out on what he needs because he hadn't had it in so long. He don't even know how bad he needs it. Yeah. 
Who aren't you trusting? Because of who you couldn't trust. God says, I, I do have somebody that don't need nothing from you. I do have somebody that's with you for you. But your pain will impact your perception. And you'll stay in isolation when you need Elisha's that God's going to send to you. And I know you're cracked. And this month, God's going to deal with our cracks. This month isn't about what he's getting ready to do for you. This month is him doing something in you. And I want you to lean in because God wants to fill every crack not with something but with himself God wants to fill you up with him Father I pray that you would fill every crack this month not with something but fill it with yourself fill me up God in Jesus name amen real quick before we go somebody raise this up real quick come on hey I want to thank you for watching and I want to encourage you to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss any of our streams and any of our videos all right if this message bless you do me a favor share it with somebody else I'll see you next time